Let's uh, get into the show here today. I want to uh, start off by giving my thoughts very quickly on Destination X. You gave your full review last night. I saw the show. It was a very good show. Uh, kind of actually reminded me in some ways of, of the UFC show in the sense that I was not blown away by the inner card at all. And the last few matches, last three matches, particularly AJ and Daniels in the main event, AJ and Daniels was awesome. And the main event was good. It was interesting because we talked about this before with the crowd. This crowd, for the most part, kind of sucked throughout the evening. And it's a live show. It's in the same place they tape TV before a live audience. These same people. And it seemed like they, and I, you know, I haven't, I haven't asked anyone, and I really should. Um, and I'll, I, in fact, I'm going to make sure to do it tomorrow. Uh, let me make a note of to myself on this. The, um, it felt to me like the crowd was smaller than usual. I mean, it had a feel like, like when I was listening to the crowd, I thought that like when they would get into chanting and stuff, it felt like it was only a couple hundred people as opposed to, you know, they usually can fit about 1,100 people in that building. And they don't know, they, they rarely get it for TV, but they usually do get it for pay-per-views. But, um... I think if it were down, it'd be down to about 900, because we surely would have heard if they had, like, 400, 500 people in that building. Yeah, but, I mean, it just sounded like when they... Like, you know, like when, when you would try to get the obvious chance, it sounded like there was, like, 20 people chanting as opposed to, like, you know, yeah, 100 people well, chanting. I mean, when, when you look at the matches here, I mean, the opener was the four-way, and it was an indie spot fest... Dakota Darso in particular was not ready for television. And uh it was it was just kind of you know, when you open up a show with a match like that, I mean you're you're starting off kind of on the wrong foot. And then Kid Cash and Mason Andrews, it's a match that nobody cared about. Douglas Williams and, and Kenny King. I mean, you had Douglas Williams who at least people knew. I mean, they knew Kid Cash as well and, and Kenny King. I would think that audience would have known the whole Kenny King story, but maybe not. I mean, they didn't really care much about that match at all. Cash and... But they, they, Kenny King didn't... You know, in both in both of those matches, though, the veteran pretty much controlled the match. Yeah, Cash and... the exact same match, one after the other. So it didn't really give the new guy much of a chance well, I mean, they're, to shine. They're, but when they did, they didn't really... Yeah, but hold on. They didn't really on. do anything. They didn't really sell well either. Okay, but they're, the goal of Kid Cash and Doug Williams was to make them look good. So they did all I, they I could. I don't think they did. The other guy had to hold up his end of the bargain. And uh, Kenny King has has just not looked good in any of his TNA matches. But they've pretty much got him now. So there you go. Sanjay Dutt looked good. And a good match with Rashad uh, Cameron. So uh, hopefully he returns. Well, Sanjay Dutt will return for sure. Yeah, Sanjay Dutt will be back for sure. I don't know about Rashad Cameron. Um, I don't know. The thing with Dutt also is uh, in the X Division the ultimate X match. He obviously got hurt early. He separated his shoulder on a, he basically did a spot and, and hit the ropes in the middle of it and uh, blew the shoulder out. And he ended up going backstage and ended up coming out for the finish, which really was just him and Zima ion climbing to the very top of the X. And then uh, Zima sprayed hairspray into his eyes and he ended up falling off and everything like that. And I, I understand that like that was their finish and Sanjay debt was going to be involved and maybe none of the other guys wanted to get all the way on top of that X. But he was, I mean, he popped the shoulder back in before he came out, but he was obviously still hurting. And and to me, it was kind of like, I don't know, maybe someone else could have climbed or it was it was kind of really hard I to have the what, excitement. That's, that's quite the bump to take when your shoulder's already out. It was. And and it kind of, I, I don't know, it, it, I understand what happened, but at the same time, it, it sort of kind of hurt the match a little. And the match was short anyway. And uh, certainly not the best Ultimate X match they ever had. Zima Ion and, and Flip Casanova was quick, I guess, because uh, I don't even know why. Maybe they didn't have a lot of faith in the match, which was kind of interesting because Zima Ion ended up winning. Angle and Joe, good match, but uh, not obviously the level of some of their matches in the past, but I have nothing to complain about here. They worked really hard. They had a really good match. Um Samo Joe now number one in the standings for the time being. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which is interesting because they're they're kind of telling the story of last year, if you recall. Samo Joe ended up with minus ten points. If that's the story they're telling, they should tell it. And they did kind of tell. It. They talked about. He did an interview. He said, kind of last year he was just looking to hurt people. This year he, <laughs> I love the line. He understood what he needed to do this year. Like somehow last year he didn't understand what he needed to do in this yeah, like win match tournament. Yeah. So uh, now he's determined to win, and 
Maybe uh, it might be him and James Storm there in the uh, semifinal prior to Bound for Glory this well, year. It would be, it would be, um, oh, yeah, it could be. It could be. It could be. You know, usually, I don't know, they may they may change it this year, but last year, if you remember, they, they do um, two matches, and whoever has the most points at the end of the two matches as opposed to, you know, two matches and then a championship match. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways they can go as far as who's in the Final Four and and all that. I would figure the Final Four would be James Storm, Jeff Hardy, Joe, and I'm not sure off the top of my head who the fourth guy would be. Um yeah, you know, it could be it could be RVD uh, or, or you know any anyone at Kurt. Um, I mean, actually, Kurt would probably be. I, I would think that Kurt might actually be a good shot at being the other one. Which, which again, you'd get two good singles matches. The thing that that I don't understand on this is that they pushed that time limit thing so big in the beginning, then they changed it, and then now it's like they never bring it up. Yet it's. It should be like part of the strategy, the whole thing, and especially like in this match, you know, they should be doing time cues and everything because it would, the whole match to me felt like they were teasing the 15 minutes and going, they went 14 and a half minutes before they did the finish. But if they're going to do that and they don't tell anyone the time, nobody else is sitting there with their, you know, watch in front of them or the timer in front of them to go, oh my God, they're teasing a finish. It was really weird that, um, they, you I know, and they should be doing that for every idea. match and, they, and should be explaining that, like, these guys have to go. They only have 15 minutes. It's not like any other match, blah, 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 you know. Did you, I, I did not get that impression that they were teasing a time limit finish. No, no, but that's why they went 14 and a half minutes. Are you sure? Or did they just go 14 and a half minutes? Well, 14 and a half minutes and a 15 minute time limit, what is it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they could have gotten 17 and nobody would have mentioned anything because it was on pay-per-view. They're certainly not uh, making a big deal po- out of it. That's possible, but they went 14 and a half minutes. It may just been a coincidence. Who knows? They yeah. certainly didn't play it up as being anything. So. No, no, that was my whole point. They didn't. They didn't yeah. mention it at all. So it maybe, maybe there are going to be no the time limit draws when, when you've in the past talked about that time limit. You know, in, in when the, when the tournament started, they talked about it. Then the next week, when they switched the time limit, they talked about it again, and then they don't talk about it at all. And yeah, it should be part of the strategy of these matches. It's like okay, you've only got a limited time limit. You know, that's that's the whole point of. You know, why do you have a time limit? Why, why did you bring up the well, time limit I think what at happened, the beginning of the tournament? I think what happened was at the beginning of the tournament, they had a 10-minute time limit because the idea was they wanted to push the 10 minutes. They wanted the story to be that these guys had to work faster. They had to pull out all the stops because they had to get this match over in 10 minutes. Then they realized 10 minutes is enough time. It gets difficult when you have to have commercial breaks. It gets difficult when you're on pay-per-view. So we'll announce that the matches now have 15-minute time limits, which is why they announced it the next week. And then... I presume they're just never going to have anybody go to the time limit, and it'll never They've be mentioned had again. Go to the time limit twice, or once or twice already. Well, maybe not at this point ever again. Are these house show I'll matches you, that well, went the time I, limit? I, I'll bet you that they they may not. You're right. I mean, I, I don't I don't know what the, what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. I would bet that they will, just because um, you know it's a way to get people. You know, they'll do everything that involved with the point system because I mean, they, they have the, it's, you know the time limit's part of the point system. We had AJ and Daniel's last man standing, which was a great match. This was a showcase of two guys that are, this sounds stupid, but this is a fact, they're great workers. And the reason I bring that up is because you could see a million AJ Styles, Chris Daniels matches, and many of them would be pretty much the same match, but this time they decided to go in, and uh, unlike a match I'll never forget, Triple H and Randy Orton at WrestleMania, after Triple H beat up Randy Orton in his house, or whatever the stupid angle was, and they start their epic battle with a lockup these two dudes are are having a a blood feud and so they went in there and they had a blood feud match they beat the crap out of each other it wasn't a lot of uh they did their spots but like you know aj did the pele on the ramp and finish was a styles clash off the ramp through a table is double juice they they basically had a great well-worked awesome fight which is exactly what they should have had in this situation and they pulled it off perfectly because they're awesome. So this was great. There was no Claire Lynch. There was nothing weird. It was just uh, two guys having a fight and AJ beating them in the end. Styles Clash off the ramp is noted. And uh, this was a great match. We had uh, Ultimate X, which I talked about. Not too much of note there except Zima Ion 1. They, of course, uh, are building up the Jesse Sorensen feud. He came out earlier and did his promos he talked about yesterday. And clearly that's going to be the match that are going to do whenever Jesse Sorensen is able to return. 
I don't know when that's going to be. I think Bound for Glory is probably way too early. I mean, the, he was backstage like three weeks ago, and he was still in the neck brace. He took it off very briefly. And to me, I mean, the idea that he's going to be back in the ring in like three months, I don't know about that one, but we'll see. And then uh, Ed Swordson, by the way, vowed to beat Ion for the X Division title, hold it until Destination X in uh, 2013, and cash it in that night and win the heavyweight title. So we'll see if that happens. And then finally, Bobby Roode and Austin Aries, they had, a re- they had a good match. Crowd wasn't really into it until near the end. I think the match got to a point where they realized that, in fact, Austin Aries had a chance. I don't know if it was a certain spot. I don't know if it reached a certain amount of time. But they figured it out. And uh, as soon as they did the spot where he got hit by a belt and he kicked out, I mean, the fans were in it from that point forward because I think they kind of knew something could happen here. And, in fact, it did. Kick to the face, brain buster, clean pin. Awesome post-match celebration, which is what you should do when a guy's held a title for seven months or whatever it is, and they've pushed him as the longest reigning champion of the current, uh, I guess the current TNA, uh, since it, I guess, changed the name or whatever. But uh, Austin Aries won, and in fact, for a trivia note, Austin Aries was, in fact, the longest reigning champion. Not heavyweight champion, but he was a significantly longer reigning champion than Bobby Roode, and he won the title, so they got over the belt, they got over the stipulation, they got over the X title, they got over the X division. It's quite the uh, deal here, and a great way to end the show. So, thumbs up show, the third in a row from TNA, so pretty much on a roll here. So there you go. To the back! Later. All right, uh, we got to get Granny on the line here. We are going to discuss her adventures in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then we're going to review Impact. And listen, everybody. Impact is the best show in the world. Wrestling-wise these days. It's like so much better than Raw that they should not even be classified as being in the same genre. One is a professional wrestling television show. And one is a modern-day version of the gong show that happens to feature wrestlers every week in wrestling matches. But, like, I am not kidding. If you're listening to this right now and you have not watched Impact in years, and listen, oh well, yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> All right, I if if this were not my job, I'd have given up on TNA so long ago. It's not even funny, but I I stuck through it for business reasons. It's my job, and now here we are in in 2012, and I cannot even believe my eyes what I see on television every week. This show was so good. Yeah. Everything about it was good. Every single segment, including segments that I was fixing to hate. Like the segment involving Claire Lynch. Even that was good. So if you've not been watching this show, you seriously, you got to start watching it. It is time to give them a second chance. Yeah. Should frankly, given- frankly, long past time, but yeah, it, it's been two, maybe three months now. Probably closer to two. But uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great show week in and week out. Uh, earlier this afternoon, I actually did watch the episode we missed while we were in Vegas. Frankly, it was even better than this one. But uh, like you say, every segment has a purpose. It either pays off on something that was set up in a prior episode, or leads into something that's going to happen on the next episode, or both. Mm-hmm. So everything you, you feel. Like you're getting a, uh, making a valuable investment of your time. Because everything leads into each other. It's not just random th- crap. So anyway, we'll review this show in a little while here. Let's get Granny on the line and get her thoughts on this lovely Las Vegas trip. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do Impact. Impact opened with the best segment of all time. And I'll tell you about it. As That's soon, no exaggeration, by the way. As soon as I get my notes open. I mean, hey, I've been talking about Bigfoot for five minutes and you couldn't get your notes open. I didn't know how long you were going to go. I think I'm going to go for, for another hour. All right. Bully Ray versus Joseph Park. For those of you who missed last week's show, which includes Brian, uh, Bully Ray got a restraining order on Abyss. And if Abyss came, he said actually if he... If he saw or saw or smelled Abyss, Abyss would be thrown in prison to rot for the rest of his life. 
Now, did they explain how that would be determined that he, in fact, he smelled abyss and not, for example, another smelly member of the audience? Or a smelly, smelly member of the family. But uh, no, no. He merely said that they made it clear abyss would not be at ringside for this match. And he said this after confirming it would be no DQ, anything goes, no holds barred, weapons illegal, blah, blah, blah. So, they're having this match, and uh, it's all Ray beating up Joe. Every once in a while, Joe would uh, he, he'd get one comeback, he did like one move, and then Ray would cut him off again. So, after a few minutes, Joe really cuts him off. And he makes a big, clumsy, untrained, fiery comeback. He just starts walloping Bully Ray in the side of the head with his forearms. And then he turns and goes to hit the ropes. And then remembers he doesn't know how. So he just turns around again and hits him some more. I was howling with laughter. Howling! So eventually, Ray goes to uh, pour some tacks in the corner. And they do a few more spots, and Joe gets a near fall, but uh, Ray cuts him off, and he's grabs him by the head, and he's going to take him over by the thumbtacks, and he's going to do something just horrible to this man. And suddenly, Joe, out of nowhere, hits a big spine buster into the tacks. Mm-hmm. The announcers had no idea how he did this. I think it was a choke slam. It was, uh, what was the deal Brown used to do it? Oh, the... Uh, the sky high. Sky high powerbomb? Yeah. Something along those lines. Point is, he threw him in the tacks. Surprised himself. He then went to make a cover, but there were tacks everywhere, so he was very careful about this, and Ray kicked out. So they're going a little more, and uh, Ray gets his chain, and suddenly Joe charges, and Ray hits him with a chain, knocks him out, and pins him. And I thought, well, that's a great finish, because Joe was not a hardcore wrestler. Joe is a, Joe is a lawyer. He's a big guy. Maybe he'd kick out of a body slam or an elbow smash, but the, the first time he gets hit with anything hardcore, he should be pinned, and he was. So I already loved this segment. And then there's more. I remember watching the match and thinking when it was over, God damn, that was a shockingly good match. And then I realized, in fact, Joe Park actually can wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, it was a good match. Yes. Although was I was watching it, like, literally believing for a while that this man was an untrained worker. Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, B Bully Ray is getting a great match out of this guy. And then I realized that, in fact, it's a work. Yeah. This is Abyss, you see. So, and on that note. Or his secret twin that nobody in the wrestling business is aware of. On which I'm that still note, hoping happens. So, Joe Park crawls to the corner. Crawls to the corner. He had been hit with a chain, he had been busted open, and he is wiping the blood off his face and staring down at his hands. Bully Ray is standing across the ring, pointing and laughing. And that would be Bully Ray's downfall. He was laughing so hard, he didn't notice that Joe was staring at the blood on his hands, not in fear, or in shock, or in pain. He was staring with intensity, but it was almost like you know, it was a calm intensity. Like, this is normal for him. And he uh, looks at Ray, and Ray charges, and out of nowhere, Joe Park hits the big black hole slam. The place goes absolutely nuts. And then Joe is kneeling over Ray, and he's staring at him, and he's breathing hard, and then suddenly he blinks a couple times, he comes out of his trance, he has no idea what has happened. He is staring at his hands. He's staring at his blood. He has no idea where he is or what's going on. The fans are chanting, that was you. That was you. He shook his head in denial, refusing to believe this. This is the gold medal winner for the best segment of 2012. This was great. Everything was done perfectly. Everything was done at the right time. Everything was paid off well. Everything was executed well. This was what, what, what wrestling should be. I only have one nitpick. I hate to do it, but I'm going to get out of the way first. And it's not really even a nitpick because I could be wrong about the, all of this, but it appears that the story is that Joe Park and Abyss are, in fact, one and the same, but Joe Park is unaware of his split personality. Yes. That only comes out when he sees the blood flow. Right. Right. So, normally he's a mild-mannered attorney, but something happened here, 
He saw his blood, and the monster abyss was unleashed. He hit his move, and then suddenly he snapped back out of his trance, as you noted. I love everything about that. Except we have had an angle where his brother was in the building. Right. A man in an abyss costume. So I don't know how that is to be explained. Maybe they'll just never mention it again. Or maybe Joe Park will say something like that something like, I don't know who that man was. I've never seen him before, and we've never seen him since. Maybe he changed clothes very quickly under the ring. He was a fan dressed up as Abyss. I don't know. But maybe the uh delusions that Joe Park is suffering from are in fact contagious. Could be. Maybe Could be like Warrior mass, in the Mirror. We all had a mass hallucination. I'm just going to forget that all happened for right now and enjoy the storyline as it is. Joe Park, aside from this just being a, a great, it was a great match. It was a great finish. It was a great post-match angle. Both men were great. And Joe Park is an awesome baby face. Oh, yeah. He was so great as a baby face. And again... I've said it 10 million times. This is a man who has spent the last decade plus under a mask. And you take the mask off, and this dude, who has been masked for 10 years, has the best facial expressions of any man in wrestling right now. It's amazing. It's astonishing. He was so awesome here. And Bully Ray is so awesome in his role. Everything about this is great. This is the best angle of 2012 by like a country mile what else is close i can't even think of anything even close to this angle like when i listen to people that talk about how awesome the daniel bryan cm punk aj no. storyline is no. it's like clearly you only watch wwe and you've only been watching it for like a year because it's impossible to be watching tna right now and think that anything in the world even comes close to the joe park bully ray storyline it's uh, my favorite feud of all time, I've decided. <laughs> it's actually way up there. So, after the break... You know what's so great about it? One more thing. No, carry on. It hasn't been fucked up yet. <laughs> it's been more than a week. It's been, like, months. It's been a long time, actually. You know how great it is to be able to watch a storyline and know that next week it's going to continue? I know. Isn't that fan that's fantastic. As opposed to, like, in the old days of TNA... Which, by the way, I think it was Austin Aries said that people have been talking about how great TNA is for the past year. That is, in fact, a lie. It got better around November, but it didn't really take off until Vince Russo left, which is about three months ago. Yeah, it's not hard to uh, draw this correlation. Maybe four months ago. Yes, well, I've been... Listen, this is not a newsflash. No. I was begging for this for nine years. Yeah. Begging every week on this show to get rid of this fool. And now they finally got rid of the fool, and lo and behold, the show is suddenly great. What a shock. But anyway, so they get rid of uh, Russo, everything's great. But anyway, the point I'm making here is that in the old days, which means any time before uh, uh, four months ago, you'd watch Storyline, and you'd get excited about it in TNA, and the next week it just would never, it would just have vanished into the ether. Or, like, it would... What they aired the next week would have absolutely nothing to do with what it aired the previous week. Same thing with WWE nowadays. I was going to say. It's like, uh, you know, my prediction is that at Money in the Bank, um, AJ calls it down the middle. And then after the match, the winner of the Raw Money in the Bank, who would be Kane, runs down and AJ helps him beat whoever's champion. And she leaves with Kane. Because you see, that would actually play into the storyline. Now... Do I think that's actually going to happen? Probably not. Most likely, John Cena is going to win, which has nothing to do with anything. And something's going to happen in the main event, and someone's going to get screwed. And it's going to be a shitty finish, and we're all going to move on with our lives. That's how little faith I have in WWE nowadays. And this lack of faith is, in fact, justified if you watch this program. There's no reason to believe in anything or anybody. But... For the last three months in Impact, they've given us a reason to believe in everything and everybody, actually. I'm sure there's an ex exception here and there. But for the most part, you could actually, if you go back and get tapes or DVDs or whatever you watch this on, 
You can start watching from the day that Joe Park appeared. And aside from the strangeness of the fake abyss returning at one of the shows, which may in fact be explained at some point, I don't know. It is just slowly built from week to week, and it keeps getting better. Just like a whole bunch of storylines on this show. So again, if you're not watching this show, please start. So, after the break, Ray is backstage picking tacks out of his gear. He ran him to interview him, and quick side note, they've, uh, you know, Jason Hervey's been doing these interviews for a long time, but he's never been appeared on camera. You just heard his voice. They're putting him on camera now. I don't know if that means anything, but he showed up more than once during the show. So, Ray asked, who was that? And he said he had beaten Joe Park, but who was that? He walked away. We had a Bound for Glory series match. Samoa Joe versus Rob Van Dam. They were doing, uh, this is two wrestlers who follow MMA, doing all their MMA spots they always wanted to do, including pummeling. Just standing there grappling for position. They were, in fact, pummeling with each other. Yeah. They did fake pummeling. They did, uh, they actually did a great job putting real moves. Yeah. Into a fake fight. They were doing like uh, side kicks and body kicks and real counters to these kicks. Arm bars, yeah, yeah. all sorts of stuff. It wasn't like a, a, it wasn't, this was not a fake, well, I guess every wrestling match is a fake MMA fight, but this was not like a straight fake MMA fight. It was a pro wrestling match where whenever a, a, uh, a spot uh, necessitated an MMA move, it appeared because, of course, everyone's trying to win via submission. Yeah. And this on that great. note, on that note, Joe broke out the coolest submission I've seen in a long time. It started off like a uh, pro wrestling figure for a leg lock, and then you turn it into a heel hook as well. And I thought, Jesus, you're breaking both his legs right here. This is awesome. So I thought that was going to be his new finish. And instead, he puts on this lethal hold, and he just kind of lets it go. And then he goes to put it on again, and Rob cradles him for the pin. So a waste of a cool move. But there is a story going on here, because every time... Joe has only had two results in this tournament. He has either won by submission or he has had a guy at a disadvantage. And rather than go for the pin, he has been greedy and gone for the submission and the extra points and it's cost him. Mm-hmm. So that's what happens with Joe in this. That's an easy story to follow. Actually, what's even better about the uh, Bound for Glory tournament, aside from the fact that it actually is good this year as opposed to last year in terms of trying to keep track of everybody's wins, losses, and points. I will say I do have uh, one one nitpick about the Bound for Glory tournament. And that is that uh, I I don't have the standings in front of me, but like you know, Joe's got thirty seven and Storm's got thirty six, I believe. And point is, some of the guys in the tournament have got like five matches or so already. Yeah, and some guys have got like one. Yes. So I, I don't. There's no rhyme or reason to win. Everybody in the end is going to wrestle each other, but. They're getting so many Joe matches. Like, Joe just had a match on the pay-per-view, and he had a match tonight. So he's had two matches over the course of time where some guys have had zero matches. I don't think Robbie E. has wrestled more than once. So at some point, it's going to be like, Joe's going to disappear off TV for a while because he's done all his matches. And then, like, maybe we're going to see the run of Robbie E. or whatever. But I feel there should be more rhyme or reason to who gets matches when. Why have some guys had, like, five matches and some guys have had one? But aside from that, my uh, that nitpick... I love the fact that in this Bound for Glory tournament, the guys who won on this show were overjoyed. True. And the men who lost were angry or despondent. Yeah. Furthermore, as we'll get to later, Bobby Roode came out when Austin Aries was cutting his victory promo as new champion, and Bobby Roode was beside himself. Absolutely beside himself. Literally, there was another Bobby Roode next to the one that was in the ring. That's how angry he was. Unlike on Raw, when John Cena loses the title, and he comes out the next night, and he makes jokes. Gotta hate Raw right now. It was the classic time John Cena actually said, titles come and titles go. That is what he said. Who on- wrote that line? That black guy should be fired. Killed. Let's be honest. Jason Hervey tried to interview Claire. She wouldn't give him an answer. Horrible actress, still. <laughs> they did. Like, maybe getting worse. A couple of uh, just quick segments throughout the show of Hogan and Sting. Uh, they were looking at the playing cards and saying they were ready for the aces and eights. 
Daniels and Kazarian came out for a promo. They called out Claire. She came down. Then AJ came down. They were all kind of shouting at each other. Daniels was trying to so say, we got to deal with the truth. And AJ was saying, no, you don't. And finally, Claire steps out and says, AJ, you're the father of my baby. And the fans all gasped. Then there was a Jerry chant. Yes, as which, in the Jerry Springer show. Yes, I was confused. I thought this was a Jerry Lawler reference, but no, oh. this makes more sense. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. I see. As soon as she said AJ is a father and the fans began to chant Jerry, yeah. that is when I turned the corner on this segment. Plus, Chris Daniels is out of this world. He's yeah. so uh, he's a superhero on this show. There is a reason AJ calls him a prick every week. Yeah. Because he's a fantastic prick. He's great. So the heels just kind of laughed and left. And uh, <laughs> as the faded to black, AJ and Claire were talking. They were not on camera. Or they're not, not on a microphone, but the TV camera picked it up. And she was saying something about how that one time, don't you remember? And AJ looked down and looked back up and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So Angle and uh, Jason Hervey confronted AJ backstage. And they want to know what was going on. He just shouted that he did not know. Trouble. <laughs> they showed clips of Zima Ion's title win. Then a strange man appeared on television. A complete mystery who this man was. He was talking the about next segment. he was Jesse Sorensen's friend. And he was upset about Zima for bragging about breaking his neck and wishing him, you know, making fun of him. And he talked and talked and talked. And they went to the ring and he said, who the fuck was that guy? Well, it was Dakota Darso. They had a short match. He was better here than he was at the pay-per-view when he was god-awful. He was better here than he was in the match he had last week, too. Now, it also went two minutes. Yes. And I will say one thing here. He looked much better here. And in particular, I, I thought this, and then Taz noted it. He, he, is, he is an athlete. He has one-step explosive ability. He, there's, this man is talented. He just doesn't know what the fuck he's doing yet. So Zima, Zima uh, beat him quickly with a gory bomb. Then he did kind of a falling arm breaker thing and got on the mic and talked about how dangerous he was. So he's going to take out all the X Division guys until uh, presumably Jesse Sorensen returns. They will fight. Mm. Aries came out for a celebration promo. People were going so crazy for him that he actually had to stop and turn around and ask them repeatedly to quiet down. So it was a great moment, not just for him, not just for the company, but for the entire industry. So it was time for a new boom period, and he would be the man to lead us there. So you got in text Don't hold your breath. Well, I was... Uh, yeah. He claimed that uh, Hollywood celebrities, NFL athletes, and other promotions world champions had uh, sent him messages congratulating him. Talked about how this was the greatest title in wrestling, he was the greatest champion in wrestling, and this is the best wrestling company going. It's all great. Out came Bobby Roode. Fans chanted, chanted loser at him. Uh, he basically had a Vince McMahon meltdown. If you remember the time when Vince was like beating up his limo? That was much better than this. <laughs> yeah. But I understand the comparison. Yeah, the, the, my, my concern was that uh, it was acting a little too goofy for the top heel. It was just, uh, too cartoony. So uh, he went on and on for a long time, and finally he just shouted fluke, and Aries just said, new world champ, and Rude stormed out. It's kind of stupid, really. I got to throw something in, by the way, that I forgot to mention in this show. Actually, I forgot to mention on Sunday. I have nothing against Taz. Taz and Mike Tanay are... Borash is much better. Oh, my God. Borash is so much better Borash than Taz. Borash was so great on Sunday. Like, oftentimes, I don't pay any attention really to the announcers. I, like, hear them. But I'm not really paying a lot of attention because there's, you know, wrestling going on and angles and bullshit. And sometimes people will go, you know, someone will be stepping in as an announcer and people will go, oh, how were they? And it's like, I don't remember. They were fine, I guess. Nothing really stuck out. I mean, you got to be, like, really bad to really stick out to me. Or apparently, really good. Because I watched that pay-per-view, and I was like, why is Jeremy Borash not doing announcing every single week on this show? You know? Have Taz be, like, a, a trainer or a storyline manager or... or have him be the interview guy. Interview guy, whatever. But uh, Borash was outstanding on that show on Sunday. He was tremendous. So Hogan and Sting were having a meeting about how to handle the Aces and Eights, which is the mystery group that's been attacking them. So Devon and Garrett Bischoff walk in. And they say, look, I owe you a favor. I want you guys to know we got your back. Hogan said, 
Nah. And they said, all right. And they left. That was weird. He did just insult them. He turned them down. After they were nice enough to do him a favor, let him know that, you know, they would watch his back when the gang attacked them. So, after dismissing their help and turning them away and insulting them to their face, Hulk then turns to Sting and says, We're in deep, brother. I don't know why. If you're in so deep, why are you turning down help? They left cards. Yeah. This, actually, I hated that segment, I won't lie. Madison talked about kissing Earl Hebner. Said they had a lot in common. They both love wrestling, and they both keep their bodies in peak physical condition. <laughs> that was actually funny. That was very funny. He had Tess Mocker versus Gail with Brooke Hogan on commentary. She was not nearly as horrible as I thought. She did say that... She uh, added absolutely nothing. She said Tess Mocker had a lot of juice, and there was a lot of weave pulling in this match. <clears throat> so uh, Gail is working over the arm... Gail used a cattle mutilation on the show, which amused me. And uh, they're brawling on the top rope, and Tess Mocker shoves her off and hits a top rope elbow, which, as you noted, was a million times better than CM Punk's. Yeah. And uh, she got the win. And then Brooke Hogan says, I am proud of her. That was a hell of a flying elbow. There she was. I don't want to say it was better than a Shawn Michaels flying elbow. No. It certainly was not better than a Randy Savage flying elbow. Or but Perry Saturn flying elbow. It was it, it was, was the impact flying elbow to CM Punk's raw flying elbow. How about that for comparison? And also literally true. We had Claire backstage. A lot of Claire on the show. <laughs> she uh, said she could prove AJ was the father. She hoped he would do the right thing. At which point Jason Hervey asked, what is that? So. The man asked the probing questions. We've established that Jason Hervey must never be allowed to have children. Yes. What is the right thing, he said. Hollywood's a weird place, I guess. Well, that's true, Vinny. That is true. Magnus did a promo hyping up a house show match with James Storm. Yeah, they're having a Bound for Glory match God. in Memphis. Memphis. There's another there's someone someone else in here talking about a match in Memphis. That's where the house show is this weekend. I, they're trying to sell tickets. I know. It's weird. We had Mr. Anderson versus Kurt Angle. It was good. I thought it was really good. Especially the last few minutes in the finish. Yeah. CM Punk, or I'm sorry, uh, Kurt Angle. I don't know where CM Punk came from. I'm still thinking about that elbow. Kurt Angle beat him clean. I bet Kurt would do a better elbow than CM Punk, too. Uh, actually, I would bet you anything that CM Punk would do a better uh, anything off the top rope. Except for the moonsault. Kurt Angle has a great moonsault off the top rope. But um, Kurt Angle is like... An Olympic caliber wrestler. But I have seen Kurt try some stuff, and his flying elbow, I promise you, would be significantly worse than CM Punk's. Which, by the way, would mean it would be significantly, significantly worse than Tess Mockers. Miss Ass Mockers elbow. What a terrible thing to say. Miss no, Tess Mockers no, elbow. No, it's fair. Miss Tessmacher's elbow. Don't feel bad. Miss Tessmacher's elbow. She's spectacular. Did you say spectacular? I said she's spectacular. I see. So, yeah, Kurt won here with the angle slam. He was uh, bleeding from the lip. Taz was screaming he must have lost a tooth. No, dude, just got a cut lip. It happens. So, backstage, Hogan is taping his fists. Sting is waving his bat around. Rude storms in. So he wants to talk to Hulk and go to commercial. Jesus Christ. I don't know if this was pre-taped. I mean, if it was, I don't know why it wasn't re-taped. And if it was live, if anybody in TNA is listening to this, stop letting Hulk Hogan explain your storylines live. Or on tape. Just at all. You can't do a retape. Stop letting Hulk Hogan explain your storylines at all. What Hogan was trying to say during this segment was Bobby Roode wanted a rematch. And Hogan said, fine, you get it at Hardcore Justice, which is the pay-per-view in August. And Rude said, I don't want to wait that long. So Hogan said, well, next week is open fight night, and we don't allow people to call out the champions. So why don't you go out and call out Austin Aries? Which, of course, 
Austin Aries is the champion, and you just said that people are not allowed to call out the champion. What he meant to say was you can't call out the champion for a championship match. But, of course, this was beyond Hogan's capacities to explain this to the audience. It is a lot of stupid, arbitrary rules to keep track of. I do hate open fight night. Open fight night sucks balls. I mean, I'll give you an example. They had Magnus on the show earlier. And Magnus is talking about how he's excited for next week's open fight night. Because the last time there was an open fight night, he chose his opponent. He looked for somebody with a weakness, and he went out and exploited it. That's all fine and good. However, it's open fight night, and to this day, I still have absolutely no idea why certain people get to call people out and other people do not. How does Magnus know he's going to be able to call somebody out next week? Is he just going to be waiting by the curtain? What if somebody calls him out? What if Samoa Joe calls him out and then kicks his ass? He doesn't get to call anybody out afterwards, or does he? Can he wrestle twice in one night? None of this has ever been explained. It's just like, last time on Open Fight Night, four of the eight competitors were randomly allowed to call out the other four. Did they flip coins? Did they draw straws? Why did four guys get to choose and the other guys were merely chosen? This has never been explained. So anyway, I don't know what the point of this rant is, except I hate Open Fight Night. And Hogan doesn't know how to explain this after all of these months. So anyway, next week it is uh, Austin Aries and Bobby Roode in, I presume, because I'm trying to fit all this together logically, a non-title match. I believe you are right. So Sting comes down to the ring. He calls out Hogan. They play Hogan's song all the way through, no Hulk. They play Hogan's song all the way through a second time, no Hulk. Well, this is live television, Vince. They played it through. It sucked. It was bad live television. So nothing happened here for a good four and a half minutes, probably. They finally go backstage. There's a bunch of very large men standing over Hulk's prone body. They're all wearing masks. Brooke is there screaming at them to stop. Hogan is calling her, trying to assure her, it's just my leg. It's just my leg. At this point, like six more guys attack Sting on the ramp. And then they left. Yeah, well, uh, I fell off a cliff is too strong, but boy, first part of the show was better than the last part. So far, this Aces and Eights angles failed every time I've seen it. I don't know if it worked last week. but the Last first week, time, it was just an envelope with cards in it. First time they attacked Sting, nobody cared. And then they attack Sting here. And I will admit that when the gang was sneaking up behind Sting, there were people screaming at Sting to turn around. Yeah. So it was not a complete failure. But I am not into this storyline one bit. And since only cards showed up last week, the Aces and Eights group appears to have grown from three men to about 16. Yes. So I don't know if... I, first thing is that Hogan and Sting better go to Devon and Garrett and apologize. I'll say. They need backup badly. Unless we got a two-on-eight uh, uh, triple-stacked cage Don't match coming. Don't say that. Yeah. Need to bring that one back. Vinny, do you realize that it has been 16 years since that match? <laughs> it was bad. I don't like to think of these things. It reminds me of my advanced age. All right, everybody. We're going to wrap it up for today. We're way over time. But uh, going to be back later on this week and a lot of stuff. To the back! Impact, go. Impact opened with the Sting coming out. He cut a promo on the Aces and Eights and called them out. Aries came out, did the same thing. Angle came out, did the same thing. Rude came out, and since he's a bad guy and the other one's a good guy, so he didn't get in the ring. He said he, he accused James Storm of being the man behind these attacks because he was jealous of everyone. This pissed Storm off. He ran out and they brawled and everyone watched. Angle finally pulled Storm off him and Rude bailed and said this proved he was right. I don't understand that logic. Had a bunch of uh, backstage promos plugging Chavo's debut. One of them was from Kurt Angle, who was very clearly reading off a script or a cue card. He could not have sounded any more wooden or less animated. We haven't mentioned that Sting came out in the Joker face paint. He's the Joker again. I don't get it. I'm more concerned about, uh, you know... The mass shooting. Well, yeah. I just feel that, like, I know they mean nothing by it. And I know that most people may not have even thought about it. But I, I, I remember but... 
I remember that night I was getting texts, and and they were essentially check with TNA. Is Sting still still wearing the face paint? Hmm. And uh, I just feel that just don't. It makes no difference. You know what I mean? If he if he doesn't paint his face like the Joker, it makes no difference. But if he does paint his face like the Joker, it reminds people of a horrific happening a week ago, and it may offend some people, and there's no need for it. So, I was disappointed in that. Well, I did not make the connection until you brought it up just now. Uh, in, the, in the following week, it did not cross my mind. Um, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't help the show. How, you know, Joker, I, my opinion, Joker Sting sucks anyway. So, anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah. We talked about the angle thing. Uh, Jason Hervey tried to interview Robert Rude. Robert Why Rude. is Jason Hervey interviewing people? I guess uh, he's a big star. I realize that he's he's part of Bischoff Hervey Productions. Right. Like he's that, he's been interviewing people for a long time, but now he's on camera. It's your average person on the street. <laughs> There's probably people watching this going, "Why is Jason Hervey interviewing people?" I can't imagine. Baffled. Too many people really imagine, remember who Jason Hervey was. Probably right. He was the big brother on a, on a TV show twenty years ago, and now he's not very big. He was also in PB's Big Adventure, so there's that. Oh, God. Gail, Kim, and Madison Rain versus Mickey, James, and Tara. I actually... Let's get the good news out of the way first. The finish was great. The rest of the match was absolutely hideous. This was... Yeah. This Let me is just talk about the finish. The, uh, the storyline, obviously, is that uh, Madison Rain has a crush on Earl. And so what they did was... They did a double pin finish with uh, with Mickey and Madison, and both girls got their shoulder up, but Mickey got her far shoulder up, and so Earl counted the pin, and Mickey is celebrating like she won, but Earl goes over and raises the hand of the girl who made out with him a couple of weeks ago, and Mickey was appalled. I actually thought it was a very creative finish and played into the storyline perfectly. Now, the match itself... Who put this match together? It sucked. It was absolutely horrendous. Tara is uh, has been doing this for a long time. She's pretty much immobile now. And uh, they were trying some double team moves that I have no idea what they were what their goal was, but I'm sure they fucked up. There's just a lot of bullshit here. Sting explained that they had to do the part of open fight night where guys argue he opened fight night. So he told Aries he had to go. Uh, he said he was too busy to handle the X Division match. So he told Aries to go do it. None of this makes any sense. He actually said, go cut some dudes. I thought he was going to like fire people. That's what I thought. Yeah. The Velvet was already gone. Yeah. But uh, it turns out he was just picking who gets a title shot. Tonight. They should just put Velvet in the room. And Aries could have gone in and said, you're a girl. Fired. That would have been the way out of the storyline. Sure. Sure. As it is, she's just going to disappear. We had uh, Sam Shaw versus Douglas Williams in the gut check match. Sam Shaw is the uh, generic MMA-looking dude from last week. He has a lot of athletic talent. He has some very wacky charisma. He is way, 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 way too green to be wrestling on national TV regularly. He looks like an indie version of Jack Swagger. Uh, Sure. So, Joey Ryan appeared in the crowd. A lot of plants there with 87% signs. Al Snow confronted him. He shoved Al down and ran away, and Al chased after him. Taz is on commentary laughing at all this. So the idea was that Shaw was actually running wild and about to go up top when this all happened, and he stopped. And after that, Williams just killed him and won with Chaos Theory. So the story is that uh, Ryan's distraction cost Shaw a chance to win. Douglas Williams is great. He is. He's a really cool finish. So we had the four guys... Arguing about who should get a title shot. It was Sanjay Dutt. This was absolutely insufferable television. Yeah. Sanjay Dutt. Sanjay Dutt. Jeets. Whatever they call him now. Kenny King and Dakota Darso. And the short men are all in there yelling at each other for a while until finally at random for no reason I can think of. Aries kicks out uh, Jeets, who is Rashad Cameron. Rashad Cameron. He got cut before Dakota Darso. That was mind boggling to me. Even knowing that everything is fake. It was, uh, yeah, the, the the payoff for Darso's dialogue in the next segment to me makes it automatically worth it. I do agree with that. All right. Chavo Guerrero debuted, came out and 
black slacks and jacket with a pink shirt. Fans were chanting his name. His uncle Hector from the Spanish announce desk gave him a thumbs up. Cut a very babyface promo about how he thanked the fans for allowing him to stand in their ring. Said this was the only company his family had never conquered. He knew there was the locker room was full of hungry young guys who wanted to steal the show, but he was there to be a champion and beat them all. It was a Chavo promo. Chavo always, uh, he's been doing this a long time, Mm -hmm. but uh, he always seems so uncomfortable. Yeah. Almost nervous. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no no one has ever, uh, you know, said, oh boy, Chavo Guerrero is cutting a promo. Those words have never crossed anyone's lips. So, Kid Cash and Gunner came out. They made fun of him for having a lot of wrestlers in his family. The one thing that was preposterous was uh, when they were they were cutting their promo on him, and I don't remember what they said, but Chavo's response was, I'm not calling myself a pro wrestling legend. These people are calling me a legend. And I was like, they chanted your name. No one is calling you a legend. Yeah. So Cash referred to the fans as government-funded jerk-offs. That was a quote. He uh, said that Chavo's uncle and father were not there because they were too old or perhaps too drunk. So Chavo started a fight. I've been around Chavo Classic and... uh, Too drunk is a safe bet. He's pretty drunk the few times I've been around him. Yeah. Maybe things have gotten better of late. I said perhaps. Perhaps he's too drunk. Chavo attacked them. There was two of them, so they were beating him up. Hernandez came out to make the clumsiest save of all time, falling over himself constantly, and then Chavo hit the best dropkick I've ever seen by a guy in a suit. Which Taz noted. Yeah. So uh, that was that was, that was was it. Chavo's in TNA. Chavo is in TNA now. And they just teamed him up with the first Mexican they saw, apparently. Angle met with Storm backstage. Wanted to make sure Storm had nothing to do with the... Uh, By the way, in the, in the, I think it was the last segment. It may have been this segment. But during the... They had the gut check match we were talking about. And uh, just a little while afterwards, they started airing uh, on the, the bottom of the screen. They started having tweets appear. It's actually the next segment, but... It was ahead. the next segment, right. Anyway, point is, these tweets... <laughs> some of them were on long enough to just barely read. Some of them were on long enough that I could have read them about 19 times through. And if you were on the screen long enough that if I hit pause, I still probably could not read them going frame by frame. Yeah. I'm not sure if they, like, have this software that it puts the tweets on the screen as quickly as they come in. Or if if someone was just going button crazy, pushing the button to air the next tweet. But that was a disaster. I have no problem with with uh, with Twitter usage that's like... It's there. It's in the background. If you want to read it, you can read it. If you don't want to read it, you don't have to. It's not smashing you in the face. It's just there. It's just a little thing. It's a little part of the show. Like when a guy comes out and they put the graphic on the screen and there's his name and there's his hometown and there's his Twitter handle. Fine. But uh, if you're going to put tweets on the screen... They should be there long enough that if you do want to read them, you can. And uh, that was not the case with the tweets that showed up on this program. They were, it was a very small window, and even in your big TV, there'd be, you know, 140 characters, actually, in this uh, very small window. And you're trying to squint to make them out, and suddenly the tweet was gone. Although there was one I could make out. (laughs) (laughs) I pointed out that Shaw did not deserve a contract because he was not polished. Included the hashtag, no Shaw. (laughs) I laughed so hard. I could not, uh, I did not send this, but I could not disagree. So, Angle met with Storm. He wanted to, uh, you know, Rude had accused Storm of being the master man behind the gang attacks. Storm denied everything. He He said he would have Kurt's back if the Aces and Eight showed up again. And Kurt left, and James stared intensely into space. AJ Styles wrestled James Storm. Bound for Glory Series match. Claire was in the front row. Claire. Shall I shall I speak of this? I think you'll do a better job of this, actually. Conan absolutely buried Claire last night on uh, Observer Radio. I believe his exact words were, I don't know where they found that bitch. He's not a fan of Claire Lynch. Well, this won't change his mind. Claire 
they put her in the front row and they told her, look mad. Yeah. And so she stood there, sat there in the front row, and she squinted her eyes in as angry a manner as possible, and she 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 uh, went, Urgh. And she just sat there unmoving with that same expression for minutes at a time. I've said it before, and I will say it again. This woman makes Dixie Carter look like an actress with great range. She could play... George Washington. She could play Abe Lincoln. She could play Barack Obama. Her range allows Dixie Carter to play perhaps every president we've ever had. That is how horrible Claire Lynch is. She may be the absolute worst actress I have ever seen. I can't think of one worse. The and only I did way- a lot of student films with a lot of bad actors. The only way I can describe this, and this is it's a terrible analogy, but I'll say it anyway. Remember Ms. Girl? Oh, yeah. Okay. She was 10. <laughs> so I believe that a 10-year-old wow. would make that expression and leave it on her face for several minutes. Claire is in her 30s. I, uh, I was once given the impression that the Ms. Girl may, in fact, have been a plant. Okay. I don't know if she was or not. I'm I'm leaning towards believing that she was not. But the point is, I think, I mean, if we presume that it was a real girl, that was someone who really was absolutely so angry that The Miz had won the WWE Championship. She was legitimately irate. That's why it worked so well. That's what acting is. If she was a plant, then she is a tremendous actor. Claire Lynch has absolutely no idea how to act. Claire Lynch is, is uh, you know, she's the actor where they say, act mean. So you think, well, what does it mean to act mean? Well, I make my eyebrows go like this, and I purse up my lips, and I go, ah! And then she sat in the front row, and she did that. And... I'm thinking about this more. <laughs> I think we'd have nightmares about this. See, you know the uh, we've, uh, oh, what's the technical term when you have something that's almost human but not quite, and it's creepy. Sure, that's what Claire Lynch is. The, the a very some, lifelike the, robot. The something gap. Yes. Here it's called. But yes, she she's almost human but not quite, and that makes it creepy. I'm gonna have nightmares. What about it makes Claire Lynch. it is funny. <laughs> oh, there like you go. this, this storyline is impossible to take seriously at this point. Yeah, because of Claire Lynch. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where they got the girl, but send her back. Literally, I mean, I don't even know what happened here. Did no one else answer the call? <laughs> they could not possibly. Oh, have, she's she's somebody's friend. They could not she possibly has to be somebody's friend. No, they, I bet they put out a casting call for a local actress. And and I can only presume that nobody else answered because I cannot, for the life of me, believe that like twenty five girls showed up and and Claire Lynch was the best. Because if that's the case, then this this agency needs to be shut down, or this mailing list, or or whatever newspaper carried the classified ad, shut down. She's really horrible. Meanwhile, there was a match going on. AJ and James Storm. It was good. Uh, not a ton of heat because it was two baby faces. They did get into it for all the and big moves way, at the end. By the way, why was Claire Lynch in the front row anyway? What was the point of this? Uh, nothing. Nothing played into anything. No. We just saw a shot of her looking mean, which caused me to laugh uproariously, which you can confirm. Yeah, yeah. I laughed uproariously for minutes on end, rewinding and looking at her mean face over and over again. And in the end, it added absolutely nothing and led to nothing on this show. So the only point of it, apparently, was to make the storyline pure comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she's in charge of aces and eights. They did run in during AJ's match. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? They did run in during AJ's match. Yeah. I was getting to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Claire Lynch is... is uh... I know you're distracted. <laughs> So, they were doing this match, you see, and Storm was running wild, he went for the super kick, but AJ blocked it and hit the Pele, and at that point, the Aces and Eights ran in and attacked AJ and beat him up, Storm was down in the corner the entire time, and uh, went to commercial with that, 
came back from the break. They showed a replay of all this. Storm was never attacked. And today said the match had been ruled a no contest. So they'll have, they will have to wrestle again. Then Storm entered the backstage area. He met Jason Hervey again. Hervey accused him of being in on this. And uh, Storm was irate. Said he never needed help to whip anyone's ass. And he stormed off. I'm emailing Conan right now. <laughs> Would you like to share the email? Sure. All right. Did you see Claire Lynch's... Dear Carlos. Mean face on Impact last night. Goddamn funniest fucking thing I ever saw. There you go. All right. I'll, so, I'll let uh, everyone know if he answers. They brought Sam response. Shaw out for the gut check. Here is what Al Snow said. He said, because of Joey Ryan, he did not get a chance to see <laughs> Shaw's match. By the way, the match went three minutes and an hour had passed. Let me just tell you what I thought they could have done if they wanted to. They could have had Bruce Pritchard go first. And maybe he'd say no. And then you have Taz go and he says Yes. And then you say, now you must kick out, so do your speech. And he does his promo. And they go to Al, and Al just goes, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. (laughs) Just like the dude in the Big Lebowski. And then they can just make this poor fucker go for a third week. So now it's like an ongoing storyline of of, uh, this poor guy having to try gut check over and over again. And in the end, he gets it. But instead, they ask Al first, and Al Snow says, well, I didn't see it. I was busy dealing with this asshole. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to see whether you were any good or any bad, or any good or or whatever, but my vote is no. Actually, it's worse than that. (laughs) It's worse than that, Brian, because he says, I didn't get a chance to see your match. I was dealing with Joey Ryan. I would like to vote yes just to piss off Joey Ryan, but instead I must vote no. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. None of that makes sense. So bad. You <laughs> didn't watch. I actually, I, I completely marked out when Al Snow made that response, and I leaped up and I screamed, you didn't watch the match! But it didn't matter. He didn't see the match, but God damn it, he was going to vote no anyway. Yeah. <laughs> There's, there's three parts to that sentence. They all contradict each other. <laughs> and they all don't fit with the storyline. This is the worst logic in t- on TNA in a long, long, long time. So then Pritchard just said yes. Shaw cut a promo about how... Uh, yeah, a hell of a promo. It was down to Taz. So he directly appealed to Taz saying, um, I am like you were when you were trying to break into the big leagues in 1999. He knew his history. Yeah. Making sure that, you know, ECW is a minor league. And... uh Begged Taz to give him a chance and say yes, and Taz said yes. I thought it was did a hell of a promo. It actually was a hell of a promo, honestly. Yeah. And the the guy does have a ton of potential. Now, I'm going to make a plea again. If anybody from TNA is listening, you got to put one of these gut check guys on television. Because you've now had three winners, and we have not seen a single one of them after they've won. So it is, it is beyond impossible to take this seriously at this point. Got to put one of them on TV or two of them on TV. If they're not ready, then you shouldn't have signed them. <coughs> I realize the Alex Shelley thing or the Alex Silva thing. I understand that it was what happened happened, but uh, two of them were not accidents. And so I think that you've got to do something with them. I mean, it's, it's comedy now. Three people signed, never to be seen again. And meanwhile, there's a new X Division dingbat getting matches on the show every single week. Which brings us to... Brings us to my favorite moment on the entire show. This actually was <laughs> awesome. Harry's is sitting there. He's got Sanjay Dutt, Kenny King, and Dakota Darso. Has to decide which, which one's getting a title shot. He's going through making a checklist, and he says, All right, Sanjay, you're a Himalayan American. Mm-hmm. He says, Kenny, you're an African American. And Kenny King, under his breath, just says, Pretty much. He says, Dakota, wasn't your dad Russian? Which is funny by itself. But Dakota says, totally straight face, sympathizer. (laughs) 
in reference to an angle that Demolition Smash did in 1986. So awesome. <laughs> so freaking great. So he should have he should have gotten the shot just for that comment. Absolutely. So he then explained that he got the job done, even if he wasn't always flashy or pretty. And Ari said, "Well, it's the X division. It's all about being flashy and pretty. You're cut." <laughs> so uh, yeah, you you if you've been paying attention to this review, you've noticed this impact has largely sucked up to this point. Thankfully, starting with that promo, it all turned around. Yes. So it was down to Sanjay and Kenny. Aries decided at this point that. Uh, Sanjay's shoulders were not fully healed. He'd had plenty of opportunities in the past. It was Kenny's turn. So, Kenny King versus Zima Ion. This was totally fine. I, fr- frankly, after... K- Kenny did not look good in some of his first uh, Impact matches, and Zima has improved drastically yes. in the past year. Tremendously. But I was still a little concerned about them doing a match on the Fly and Life TV. Totally fine match! Yeah, they did a great job. Yes. Everything was giant thumbs up here. So, King is running wild... He is set to hit a springboard dive when Bobby Roode ran down after, you know, leaving the building earlier. He yanked him off the apron. He threw him into the post, threw him back in the ring. Ion hit a uh, springboard moonsault and got the win. Thumbs up match. Very good. We then had uh, what turned out to be the main event match. Actually, it was the main event. Kurt Angle versus Bully Ray in a Bound for Glory series. This was a great match. They had a... This was a great pro wrestling match, yes. I know that's shocking that Kurt Angle was involved in a great pro wrestling match, and I was going to mention this on, I can't remember what show we were talking about it. Maybe it was the Conan show. We were talking about Bully, but um, I remember, uh, I always thought that Team 3D was a better working tag team than a lot of people gave them credit for being. But then when I heard that they'd open up their own wrestling school, it was like, well, I guess everybody opens up wrestling school. It's not that big a deal. But uh, I don't know if Team 3D's school is the first school that I'd go to personally, especially if I wanted to be a singles wrestler. But Bully Ray is a great worker, and he's got a tremendous grasp of psychology. And that wasn't exactly – I mean, that was evident in this match. But in a lot of his matches – and and just things that I know from from talking to people in TNA about ideas that he has and and things like that. This dude knows pro wrestling. Yeah. And uh, him and and Kurt Angle together, this was fucking great. This was a great match. And uh, Kurt Angle won clean with the Olympic Slam after they kicked out a, bu- a bunch of different moves, including and, uh, Bubba Bubba Ray kicked out of an Olympic Slam. Yeah. And then he did not kick out of the second one. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, yeah, they, they, the other point that he's mentioning is uh, at one point, Angle hit a uh, belly-to-belly suplex. You've never seen Bully Ray fly through the air like you have here. He went up for this dude. And I realize, and Taz noted this, Bully Ray ain't 400 pounds anymore. No. He's not small. And he flew through the air. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was uh, like said, just a hell of a match. And uh, Angle eventually hit the Angle Slam and won, so seven points for him. Aces and Eights immediately arrived. Uh, I think they attacked them both, but Bully Ray just disappeared, honestly. So they're beating up Kurt. Sting, Aries, and AJ come down to try and make the save. They win for a bit, but then they are outnumbered and overwhelmed. Storm's music hits. He runs down, and the Aces and Eights throw up their hands and walk out. Storm never even got to throw a punch. So all the others know that, hey, wait a minute, James. Maybe Rude was right. Maybe those guys don't want to fight you. Maybe you are in charge of this. And the show ended with Angle and Storm going nose to nose and shouting at each other. Tanae conveniently pointed out they were going to wrestle in Bound for Glory series match next week. And the show went off the air. And, uh, yeah, for 90 minutes, this show sucked. And for a half hour, it ruled. Yeah. Two very, very good matches on the show. So if you get a chance, watch the last half hour of Impact. And uh, you may as well watch some of the earlier stuff just for the pure comedy of, uh, of Claire Lynch. All right, everybody.